And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from Nomnivore Games, which is... Wit, whose monster is eating its own logo. Does that count as cannibalism? And one of the and one of the head creators of Emberwind, the one and only Derek Chung. How are you doing today, man? Hey everyone, uh, thanks for having me. And honestly, I'm doing way better now that I'm in the great company of other people who drink. <laughs> um, I hope I hope you I hope you don't mind sake, because that because that's the drink of choice for me tonight. Oh, not at all. So long as you don't mind me sipping on some soju. Mm -hmm. yep. Um, I ran, I I ran out of I ran out of soju, and I'm not in the mood for vodka. So that so happy medium it is. Plus, the whiskey that I have, I I use for Irish coffee, and it's way too late at night for coffee. I mean, it's morning somewhere in the world, right? <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Ha not like I haven't heard that one before. <laughs> well, I mean, you can hear it as many times as you need to drink. True. Yeah, but uh, again, you know, thank you so much for having me here. It's awesome to finally have a chance to be on uh, your show. Mm -hmm. I've had a chance to listen to, in to some of your previous shows, uh, such as the one with like Chibi or Elia, and uh, honestly, oh, they're all so so wonderful. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so I'd I'd like to start at the humble beginnings, as is tradition around here. Sure. Um, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games, and what about it made it stick? Oh, okay, that's uh way further back than most people ask. Um, yeah. So with role playing games, you're talking about like tabletop specifically, video game. Like, does it does it super matter? Or are we even talking about like running around the playground with sticks and pretending that you're like a Power Ranger? Um. First off, good good call, good call bringing that up. But as tempting as it would be to focus to focus just on tabletop, experience has taught me that that the that um, you can't really put the dividing line between getting introduced through through video games or getting introduced through um, tabletop RPGs specifically, because with a lot of people, the it's um it's a case of chicken and egg. Yeah. Yep, I totally um, get that. So just the just so instead, I'd like to paint a broader brush and just roll just the idea of role playing with with codified rules in general, whether that be in a, whether that be in front of a computer or in or in front of a table. Okay, um, I guess uh, I probably started like as early as I can possibly remember. Um, I grew up with like a Super Nintendo in my hands and I was like a devout fan of just about every single role playing game that you could think of from, you know, the classics of things like Breath of Fire, and Final Fantasy, uh, you know, the Legend of Mana series, all that up to, uh, um, well, really uh, any sort of like tabletop or board game I can get my hands on. Um, back then it was always kind of hard for me to get on or get other people to play with, um, unfortunately, because I lived in a pretty, uh, small and quaint town on like the far outskirts of the, uh, GTA for anyone who's not from Canada, GTA just means the greater Toronto area. It's Toronto and not like all the surrounding cities. And then like one extra step removed from that is kind of like where all the farmland is and all the little small like towns. And I used to live in one of those little towns. So um, yeah, didn't really have too many chances to get uh, into kind of group-based uh, RPGs until like much later into my life. So uh, at the beginning, it was really just about playing those uh, single-player um, role-play heavy story games. Mm -hmm. And with with that in, with that in mind, when it came to were you some, were you somebody who got who got introduced to as just 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 coming on to just coming onto someone else's table or did or did you try and did you try and gm in in your early times 
Uh, I guess the earliest time I picked up a role playing game, like a, a true tabletop role playing game, was around high school, and this was kind of an interesting transition, since um, uh, when I moved from like an elementary school to high school, as a lot of people tend to experience, your friend groups completely shift around, completely change, and so forth, and. Uh, I still remember um, this one one guy. I don't know if I can like specifically name drop him, but he had with him a bunch of D and D manuals. Um, back then, uh, all the rage was like 3.0. 3.5 wasn't even out yet. If I'm showing off how old I am, and uh, yeah, like compared to all those like annoying math, geography, and French textbooks, a D and D manual is much more appealing to flip through. So um, during like any particular recess or, or period where I didn't have class uh, and this guy was around, I'd flip through that particular book and I got swept away by all of the interesting kind of opportunities, the possibilities of this giant imaginary world that you can delve into. Um, like most players, I end up starting off uh, on the side of a character first, you know, playable character and all that, because the idea of GMing was really much too daunting. Um, and it also probably didn't help the fact that I uh, didn't have access to a DMG to start with and just the player's manual. So, um, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's kind of, I guess, my starting point. It is funny looking back on the 3.0 days, given that there were certain, th there were certain things in three, with a, what a lot of people think of when they think of three, when they think of third edition, they end up thinking of, um, 3.5 because a lot of those 3.0 classes were a bit, jank <laughs> uh you're you're putting that lightly right i'm tr i'm trying this whole being nice thing that everybody keeps telling you is all is all the rage these days it's a work in progress <laughs> um well you can you can definitely be nice but still have like a, a firm opinion about something and honestly <laughs> um in my opinion as well like uh, if i can maybe put some words into your mouth like i found 3.0 uh, I, I guess the the best way I'd put it would be like rough around the edges, at least when it came to like balancing. And it was it was definitely like just, in my opinion, like diving off a cliff when it comes to trying to be accessible to new players. Um, from what, although the th the thing that the thing that I find especially especially funny from the people that I've talked to who have who have worked on it, um. The reason why prestige classes, which all logic would all logic would suggest should be in the player's handbook, because they are a player facing system, but instead the first prestige class was in the DM's guide, is because they ran out of room. And I had I have contested that maybe they wouldn't have had that problem if they had if if they if they hadn't festooned the player's handbook with so many damn redundant spells. Yes, uh, I completely agree with that. Though I do think that there is a benefit to all those redundant spells as well. Um, if not necessarily for the gameplay, at the very least for that like first step into this imaginary world and like as, as like the brand new player thinking of all the possibilities that the world of Dungeons and Dragons will provide you, it's a really, really cool way to like open your eyes to what you could do in the game. Right. Uh, sure. After a couple sessions, when you realize like this spell is completely like useless, I would never use it ever. Uh, then yeah, you can definitely cut down a bunch of uh, the content there. But like for the for not like the day one player, but for the day zero player, there there's definitely a lot of promise that all the those kind of uh, less than useful spells, I'll put it, you know, mm -hmm. presented. Yeah, and I um. Some time ago, I did an experiment going through a bunch of fantasy game core books and the and and do a ratio of pages total versus pages of spells. Um, three point five and Pathfinder were the two biggest offenders. I mean, three point five and Pathfinder are basically the same thing. So, are you striking the same game twice there? Since they're di since they're different titles, technically I ha I have to treat them as such. But um, Pathfinder had it be had it beat out. The only reason Pathfinder got second place was because it had more pages. Period. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you can't uh, win, you might as well lose in more creative ways, I suppose. Yeah. Um. 
and I, w but I, I look at I look at that system as an attempt to try and to try and unify mechanics that had been pr that had been present. Um, I will admit I'd love to be a fly on the wall when it comes to when it comes to Skip Williams's take on sorcerers because he. Ha the story that I've heard is that he despised the sorcerer class, and um, he fe he fe he f he felt they didn't deserve to be in the same casting category as wizards. That's the story. That, that's the story that I've heard that he that he didn't care for them. I don't know. I don't know the full details whether whether or not that's the case. And to be fair, the third edition version, which was doubling down on spontaneous casting wasn't that effective yeah um i i don't know i don't have like any insider knowledge on like how wizards operated now or back then so i can't say for certain mm -hmm. uh if there was like a particular favoritism towards one class or another but there was definitely um, favoritism do... towards casters i can say that oh much. oh yeah definitely <laughs> um but it's i don't know if that's necessarily favoritism or if that's just design space right like it's very easy to come up with all these inventive ways to do supernatural stuff but like how many ways can you make a martial class do cool things that isn't just attacking more times in a turn right so i i honestly think they kind of painted themselves into a corner there and then didn't come up with a creative way to get themselves out of it uh but at least going back to like the sorcerer and the wizard thing like the sorcerer always struck me as this uh as this oddball class like it wasn't quite a spellcaster they really just felt more like um a character with like very limited superpowers like it was almost like a superhero spliced into a fantasy setting which if you're getting which if some if somebody really wanted a really wanted supers in their fantasy honestly they may be better they may be better off with um with mute with mutants and masterminds in that case <laughs> <laughs> True. Oh, and uh, don't get me started on GURPS. Um, I, I have, I have taken some time picking on picking on people who are, who are members of the Church of GURPS. Um, largely because they, largely because they keep telling me that GURP, that it's the only game that I actually need, because, it, and, my mind and my mindset is, when I cover games, I am a tailor. And not every game is going to be for everyone, and the universal games have their own drawbacks, namely that they're going to have, namely, more work for the GM. Which yeah, some G some GMs will will not have a problem with it, but it is something to be wary of because, given the given the amount of moving parts, it's very easy to, for a player who knows what they're doing to break it. Hell, even with something, even with something that isn't universal, they can find a way to break it because. Well, pun pun exists. Yep, yep, yeah. Uh, yeah. Even things like Dungeons and Dragons uh, would run into your your typical and hilarious cases of things like peasant railguns and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, I still remember from some of my earliest sessions one of the most beautiful. Uh, I'll call it an exploit, just to be fair to the designers, but really it wasn't. Was figuring out that the most powerful level one spell, uh, especially for like a wizard or sorcerer, is not magic missile, but mount. And the reason for that is because uh, you get to summon the horse 30 feet in any direction and they don't tell you it can't be up. I made an up button trap once. <laughs> it's, exactly oh. what it, it's exactly what it sounds like. You hit, you step on the thing, you go straight up. Yep, yep. So, if, yeah. If I want to get technical about it, you are sub you are subject to a fly spell for si for six seconds, going forty miles an hour straight upwards. That uh, that honestly sounds extremely painful on landing. Well, the one well the one time it one of the infamous times it got used, a dragon stepped on it. But we're it, but we're it underground, and the wall and the walls are the walls are made of adamantite. So he wasn't he wasn't breaking through that. But it's but it still said that he had to go up, so he got crushed to death. See, like those types of stories, while very funny, um, also kind of showcase 
uh, really, I think, one of the strengths of these rule heavy systems, too. Because when players find ways to not necessarily break the rules, but like interpret them in ways to pull off shenanigans like this, that's what leads to all those super memorable moments that people call back to and look on to fondly of, right? So I like I, I don't know if it's necessarily a problem for games to have things like that. Um, right? Like at the end of the day, everyone's just trying to have fun. So if the game system is allowing you to have fun, even if it's not necessarily based on how the game originally intended that to be, is that a problem? Right? Like it's a it's a kind of a cool little happy accident type thing. Mm-hmm. And it's funny you bring that up because a lot of there's there's been a bit there's been a bit of a push that I've been critical of of this idea of complex rules bad simple rules good which I th- which I think is far I think is far too narrow of a of a uh, view of it. Yeah, uh, no, I pe- completely echo that. It's it's a pendulum. There are ways to do there are ways to do simple rules poorly. And there are ways to do complex rules poorly. Um, you can go too far one. You can go too far one way or the other. It's more about making the making the rule set that facilitates the kind of ga- the kind of play style or story that is me- that is meant to be used. Um, an example of si- an example of simple going too far would be, and I know I know I'm stepping on some toes here, but I don't care. Fate. I I can see where you're coming from from that. Um, in my like very humble opinion, and this has to really do with just what I prefer in my games, fate doesn't really fall too well into like what I happen to enjoy. But that doesn't mean I don't get why it's fun, and that doesn't also mean I can't have fun with it. And most importantly, that also doesn't mean I don't see the appeal to a system like that. Um, for certain people, they like. Uh, for lack of a better term, more crunch in their games. Uh, there are going to be people who like things that are more loose. And the looser something is, um, I think that there's more room for like adaptation into uh, roleplay, mm-hmm. which is also very fun for you know certain types of gamers. Um, I, I think the the real issue here with simplifying systems or this idea that simple is good um, comes from the fact that there's a really difficult learning curve or accessibility point into the more complex systems, um, right? Uh, and, and I don't mean that as in like uh, complex bad. I just simply mean that complex has 300 pages of rules. Someone may not have time to try and read all that and master all that. Yeah. So the, the idea here is, in my opinion anyways, is not that complexity is bad. So much uh, is that it is that like, inaccessibility is bad and there are some very very cool and elegant ways you can make uh complex crunchy whatever you want to call those systems more accessible it just comes down to how elegant you can make the systems design around it be a lot of times it does go for it um the big reason that i pick on fate in this regard is is actually in it and this is a trap that a lot of the simpler games fall into is the issue of guidance because a problem a problem that I've a problem that I've covered with the fate games that I've talked about is not making it very clear what the what the dividing line on aspects is in terms of what would be a good what would be a good what would be a good example of a type of aspect and what would be a bad example of a type of aspect because um, I don't have I don't have that problem with say not the end which is really really good because it because it goes out of its way to give examples on every on every part of it of its systems. Yeah, but like the thing like not to disagree with you but to play the devil's advocate here. If you go to the other extreme, you end up with systems like uh you know Dungeons and Dragons where you've got hundreds upon hundreds of tables that you can roll for for literally every possible situation. Let right, me raise you then, one. Okay, go for it. Yeah, Phoenix Command. Yeah. Okay, that's <laughs> not one that most people know, so I didn't go there. But like, yeah, like the the more specific scenarios uh, that there are, sure, that's great. There's a lot of guidance it's providing, but like, 
I don't know how many people want to spend their their Friday night where they're supposed to be, be having fun flipping through effectively like a giant encyclopedia of you know tables and things to figure out what to roll for what, right? So like even when I was playing uh, a lot of like more heavy rule systems in my own free time with my friends, a lot of the time the GM would just make up something dumb, roll a die, and be like, "That's what happened." They'll just be like, oh, yeah, you know, roll, I don't know, like a, a fluke check. No idea what gets added to it. Just if you roll well enough, sure, the story thing happens. Yeah, and obviously, when it comes to, when it, when it comes, when it comes to, um, when it comes to complexity, it's more, it's more about the, more about the direction. That's, that's the, that's the attitude, that's the attitude I've had. Um, the, but but go but going into going into that, I'd like to talk about the early the early development of Emberwind. Um, oh yeah, sure. Now, when I first came across Emberwind, I had there were there were a couple of things that I that that struck out to me. One is that I couldn't help I couldn't help but sense that there was a little bit of the DNA of the of the one edition of D and D that everyone tells me I'm supposed to hate, but. I don't because their checks don't clear. And yeah. the and the other th the other thing was the visual design for whatever reason reminding me a lot of Guild Wars 2. Yeah. Um <laughs> Now with, with are both of those accurate or or is that or is that me reading too much into things? No, those are completely accurate. Uh those are definitely some of the influences that went to the design of Emberwind. Mhm. Mm uh, I'm assuming you probably want me to say a little more than just that. <laughs> yeah, we yeah because um, and anybody's everybody's design is is usually an expansion or a response to to something else, and what given given the mention of fourth edition, what were some, what were some of the things that struck you that kind of carried into Emberwind in your opinion? Okay, so before I answer that, I probably have to give a little bit of background information about myself. So, uh, excuse how long this answer is going to be. Um, first and foremost, uh, to just kind of go back to the history here, I started really kind of getting to tabletop role-playing games around 3rd Ed. 3.5 came out, played a bunch of that. 4th Ed came out, also played a bunch of that. And this is um, during the time that I was experimenting with a, a bunch of other tabletop RPGs, and I'm saying that like, I don't know, I was like experimenting with drugs or something. Really, you know, kids, uh, careful with tabletop RPGs, not even once, right? Um, but, uh, jokes aside, um, on, on top of that, I also spent a lot of my time playing a lot of MMORPGs. Uh, stuff like uh, old school, you know, Ragnarok Online, to stuff like uh, Guild Wars 1, Guild Wars 2, all, all, all the, the fun, super awesome everything that everyone in like the 90s and the 2000s enjoyed. Mm-hmm. Um, and because I had such a breadth of experience with all these different games, I really noticed that, uh, there were strengths to basically every system as well as drawbacks to every particular system. And each particular game, uh, was designed in a manner to appeal to a particular audience. Now, during this whole time where I was doing all this, this uh, you know, nerd stuff, where I was playing games and so forth, I was also doing a bunch of other nerdy things, which was getting all my degrees, getting fully educated, and getting set up with my uh, profession of being a psychotherapist. Mm -hmm. And in becoming a psychotherapist, in doing all the stuff in mental health care, I came to a realization uh, very early on in kind of my studies and all the work and the research that I was doing that really the whole goal of therapy is to work the therapist out of a job, right? Like you don't want people coming in to see you forever. Ultimately, you want people to be well enough uh, emotionally, mentally, and in more ways than that to be able to stand on their own two feet, supported by the people around them that they happen to love and care about, be that mm -hmm. their family, be that their friends, and so forth. And a phenomenal way of doing that comes from building this person up not only through uh their skills but also in a way where they're generating very rewarding experiences with other people mm -hmm. and um i honestly through my own experiences while growing up uh, and i'm certain a ton of people will echo this sentiment even people who are just listening in on this as well right now um hell even you mildred 
uh, is that like those experiences you can have from everything, right? It's not just when you're sitting in a sterile office talking to a therapist about, let's say, what your mom did to you when you were growing up for a 50 minute hour. Uh, you're going to have these great transformative experiences from moments that, let's say, you, you shared with a friend, uh, the time that you spent playing a game, something that someone said that just stuck with you because it, it shifted something inside you a little bit. Mm -hmm. So um, when I kind of thought about all that, I realized, you know, with how important gaming is as not just a hobby, uh, a form of escapism, but even this thing that helps teach people and allow people to experience whole different walks of life. I figured that, uh, you know, why why focus all of my attention into doing therapy with just one person at a time when I could maybe design something that was able to generate these types of rewarding experiences between people in a much grander way with a much farther reach. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of that, um, when I was designing Emberwind, I really had to try and answer one of the most impossible questions of all when it comes to game design, which is how can we make this game appeal to every single person at the same time? So because of that, uh, I really had to break down the way that the game was built. And my kind of answer to that was developing not one rule set, but multiple rule sets that fit together into a modular system. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the system that's currently known as Rise that Emberwind runs on. Mm -hmm. And a starting point for all that had to be through building things in a simple fashion. Something that where someone who had literally no idea what they're doing could bite into. And of all of those game systems that uh, were around at the time when I was first working on, at the time, it, held, it wasn't even called uh, Emberwind back then. It was called, and I'm so embarrassed to say this, but Dungeons and Derek. Because it, it started <laughs> off as like a homebrew and a modification on D&D. On &D. For what it's worth, um, for what it's worth, sorry, sorry to cut off, but for what it's yeah, worth, yeah. a a homebrew that evolves into its own thing, you are in good company. <laughs> Thank you. Because that's how Rollmaster and that's how chivalry, chivalry and sorcery and hell, and hell, that's how certain versions of um of games of games like Anima got started. Well, hopefully those started off with better names than Dungeons and Jarek. But you know, I don't. I don't know. Mind. I had. I don't know. I covered a game a few years ago called Dungeons: The Dragoning Forty Thousand Edition. I mean, that's pretty funny. Like for anyone who is that nerdy, like they get it, and that's that's hilarious to them. But uh, but yeah, sorry. Um, heading back to your your original question there, um, Four E effectively did a really good job of it, and the reason why Four E did a great job of that was. Honestly, I I think it was a solid game. There were definitely problems with it, but it rebuilt. And in, in this is my opinion. I don't know if this is true. I wasn't on the, the, the development team or in the room when they were talking about and figuring this out. But I really feel like they took a lot of inspiration from MMOs when they built 4E, right? All the abilities, like your Atwells and so forth, kind of they, feel a bit like a skill bar with like they you know, did, your, your cooldowns, right? They did to they did to a point. I can I can certainly see it, and that was something that among certain people was a contention. And I would I would always laugh when somebody when somebody did the whole they're turning they're turning D and D into an MMO because it was very clear to me that they had that they had very little their um threshold for what counted as turning it into an MMO was very low, right? And there um, were there were lots of things in MMOs that are really good too, right? Like the the fact that they were so much more popular. Right, it was like literally the king of games back then. Uh, now, you know, completely taken over by public battle royale games and uh, and mobile games. Right, but like back then, uh, they were the end all and be all. Like everyone wanted to be the next World of Warcraft. So it made sense, in my opinion, for them to take inspiration from that because and, and one of those things I think they took a lot of really good inspiration for was making a very accessible tabletop game. Like I knew so many people who could never get into three or even three point five that finally got the first taste of a TTRPG because 4E came out. Granted, a lot of people who were upset about it didn't like it, in my opinion, simply because it wasn't the experience they were expecting from a Dungeons & Dragons game. But taken alone, had you changed the name to literally anything else, I think people would have given it like a much bigger pass than it has right now. Right? Like It's just got this terrible reputation just because it didn't live up to the expectations that the player base had. I would I would say that um, there... There's a term that there's a term that I've used called overhate, where something get something gets 
something crosses a threshold where it just becomes the cool th the cool thing to the cool thing to hate instead of or you're not even hating on the on that particular thing but the idea of it um if i had to use an example it would be the amount of the amount of hate that um that co that cod was get that cod was getting before it actually turned to and by cod of course i mean call of duty before it actually turned to abs absolute <laughs> crap yeah, like it, before it fulfilled the prophecy that people had described to it or prescribed yeah. to it, yeah. Um, sim simply because in the in the early days of it, it was it was fair it was fairly respected. Um, that said, I mean, I I even from the very beginning hated martyrdom. Like that that hate was legitimate. Oh, I'm the I am not. I will not defend martyrdom. I will not defend Juggernaut, <laughs> and I will certainly not defend Last Stand. Um, although. Although, although I will, yeah, I will defend yeah. eavesdrop. We're, because we're in good that's company funny. here. <laughs> I will defend eavesdrop yeah. because that's because that's always funny, and I and I will freely admit that I was one of those kind of people, kind of people who would put claymores at the top of ladders. I in just about any shooter that I could. Yeah. Mostly, yeah. mostly because mostly because it's funny for them for someone to climb up a ladder and then get blown up. I mean, yeah, always funny, no matter how many times it happens. Well, in, in some cases, this, in some cases, I have to go. What, what the heck did you think was going to happen doing coming into a match with me in it? Well, I mean, unless you were infamous, at some um, point you might have been at, as you know the Claymore guy. Um, but among among some of my friends, I've I've been nicknamed the Prankster Prince. <laughs> well, I'm surprised they're still your friends. Well, with fr with friends like mine, who needs enemies? Uh, I'm pretty sure they say that about you, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, uh, I guess uh, going back to that, that's kind of where the inspiration came from for at least some of Emberwind's systems designs, which is, you know, 4E. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously there were shortcomings to 4E, so I was trying to address some of that with Emberwind, designing a way that was uh, more interactive, more interesting, had lots more player input, uh, and you know, simplify a lot of the the stuff that I think they they really kind of messed up on, such as leveling, mm -hmm. where like every time you level up in, in uh, 4E, you would get like a bunch of plus ones, but everything else would get plus ones, and it would net to literally no no benefit. Right? Numbers just, go well, up. Everyone, yeah, numbers go up. You feel good because they did, right? When it's not truly actually achieving anything. Mm -hmm. um, and then when it comes to the aesthetic design, uh, yes, uh, definitely inspired by by Guild Wars. Um, not the only inspiration. Uh, same thing with 4E not being the only inspiration for systems. Mm -hmm. But um, I am a diehard fan of Guild Wars uh, 1. I, I also kind of liked what they were trying to do with Guild Wars 2. Um, though it had more shortcomings than I think Guild Wars 1 did. Um, but the the style that we were working on, that we developed, that I haven't put together with a couple of my extremely, extremely talented friends, and honestly I can't say thank you enough to the friends of mine that helped work on all the art for Emberwind with me. Um, we, we actually put it together for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, we were trying to come up with an aesthetic that was really unique, really different than anything else that you'd anyone had ever seen in tabletop games, but not so different that people looking at wouldn't be able to recognize what it was. Um, and a part of that was really kind of imagining how a role-playing game would work. And the idea there was, if you close your eyes and try and think of this imaginary space between you and all the other players around the table, uh, you would kind of have this focal point, right? Like you'd see like the face of the character, the or maybe the weapon that they're brandishing, something like that, something where your attention was being drawn to. Everything else would be there, though the details would kind of get fuzzier and fuzzier the further that it went out uh, from there until it kind of just went from loose shapes to just like uh, amphromorphous blobs or something like that. And we wanted to play around with that idea with uh, the art, right? Mm -hmm. How could we capture that effect? So the art style that we have is very high fidelity at the particular focal points that we want to direct your attention to as the detail starts to lose out into the uh, kind of original base shapes for the particular character before, rather than just have ink splotches, we use these vivacious, energetic brushstrokes to symbolize energy to try and really make the, the artwork 
um, tell its own story, right? Like you don't even need to read the abilities of the druid to know just how exacting, potent, and powerful that the druid in Emberwind is going to be. Uh, and that had to do with a couple reasons. One, accessibility again, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Not everyone likes to read words, right? So to help those particular people uh, get into it, to try and make sure that the game was very inclusive, we needed to make sure that the artwork could stand alone, could tell enough of a story on its own, that there was a ton of appeal to it, that you knew what was going on even before you read the first ability on their list. Mm -hmm. The second reason behind all this is because um, back then, uh, and I say back then because it's no longer the case, but uh, my friends who helped work on this with me, they actually ran a studio um, in Toronto here called Crush Visual. And I, I don't know how much you know about like the film and the entertainment industry, but um, a lot of the big name studios out there, like the AAAs, uh, like Riot, like uh, you know your general like Hollywood studios, all that type of stuff, they usually take on more work than their in-house teams can handle. And when that happens, they usually need to reach out to what are known as boutique studios and hire outsource help to do particular work, sometimes to do direction, storyboarding, all that jazz. And if you are a U.S. studio with a limited budget, you need to pick between hiring other Americans or hiring a Canadian studio, which is just as good uh, Western talent, but at a 30% discount because up here in Snow, Mexico, we use Monopoly money. <laughs> Snow, Mexico. And... I've never heard that one before. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, because of that, um, my friends ended up having a chance to work on AAA literally everything out there. Um, right from from things like League of Legends to Oscar nominated movies, there if you've seen it, they've done work on it. Uh, even stuff that's currently uh, out, stuff like The Expanse and other things I can't even talk about because NDAs. Mm. But um, but the thing there is, uh, they also because of their experience in such a breadth of fields and working for a bunch of different companies, they realized that like a lot of up and coming artists didn't really have too many chances to find employment. Um, which is why so many artists end up going the independent route and then either becoming full-time freelancers or uh, mixing some of that in with going to conventions and doing fan art. Mm -hmm. But um, anyways, uh, a large part of that problem is because Toronto, we have a lot of art schools, but most of the art schools teach you traditional art, right? Like how, how to hold a paintbrush, color theory, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. They don't teach you anything you need to know on how to actually get a job in the industry. So... Uh, my friends at Crush took it on themselves to open up their own arts. It was this thing where that I was trying to drive forward that had all this really cool appeal all this uh, all these like important accessibility and mental health messages behind it but also because it became this amazing opportunity for all these young students to do a portfolio piece with mm -hmm. right to say that hey I have worked on something that looks this triple-a good you should hire me mm -hmm. so in mind One of the other things that I that I found very interesting is having two having two systems for resolution and two systems for for character creation. Um, I'd like to focus on the latter the latter first. The yeah. uh, the whole thing of the aspect and the attribute system was it a, was it a case where that were those were two, were those were two systems that just just kind of coalesced on their own and you and there, and um, it and everybody was torn on which one, on which one to go with. So just go with both of them, or was there a different route to how those two systems came about? Because 
you don't really see the idea of mu of multiple approaches like that right. like that in character creation. So um, the fascinating thing is the amount of the Rise engine that's currently out that people have seen, that people play, that people know as Rise is really just the tip of the iceberg. There's actually over a dozen character creation methods that I've drafted up that all work, that all play out very well. But the problem with releasing 12 different character creation methods is that uh, people get spoiled for choice to the point where there's option paralysis. So we actually cut mm -hmm. it down to only two systems to so that we would be able to reap the benefit of having multiple systems while making sure that we weren't overwhelming people coming into the game. And the two systems we ultimately chose to put out is the aspect and the attribute system. The attribute system is a pretty simple one. It's self-explanatory to why we have it. It is the, you roll stats, you have numbers, numbers get assigned to places, those places determine your other things that you actually use, like how hard uh, your sword hits when you roll for damage, that type of stuff. And uh, the reason why that one exists is because, well, hey, you know, everyone who's coming from a tabletop game knows what that is right everyone who's coming from a video game should probably know what that is and familiarity is a really good thing for people to see and have in a game because there's no reason to reinvent the wheel right like mm -hmm. if you're used to wasd for movement on a keyboard in a game there's no reason why i need to make it hb and m right it, it's it, there's no no point for that so that's why the attribute system exists now the other system the aspect system is the unusual one so as i said earlier um I'm a mental health professional, and I really want to make gaming super accessible to every type of person. And one of the things that intimidates people from picking up tabletop games is the sheer amount of math that you need, right? And not only that, but there's like a translation error in a lot of people's brains where they're trying to figure out like how this particular number here corresponds to these particular traits in the game which then corresponds to these types of personality or character characteristics, right? Like it just... There, there's a lot that you have to kind of just give the benefit of the doubt to, which is much harder than just saying, hey, I have an idea for my character, and let me describe that character with some words, and now my character is built. Mm -hmm. right? So it's a, a flip of the script, really. Um, and this, you know, coincidentally turned out to be the exact type of system we wanted uh, when we wanted to pick one particular system that was really good for people who were uh, math-oriented and one system that was really good for people who were, let's say, word or language-oriented. Mm -hmm. And... With that in with that in mind, the other avenue that I wanted to that I wanted to delve into is the is um is the is the dice approach and the deck approach, which the the latter the latter um kind of kind of reminded me of some of some of the resolution systems I see I see in some in some more unorthodox approaches and even even. Even stuff like not the end isn't too far off from it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess I'll start with an overview for any listener here that doesn't really know what Mildred's talking about. Uh, Emberwind has two different systems for how you as a player would resolve a role-playing scenario. The first system that he's describing is the die roll system. And then the second system uh, that he's talking about, the unusual one, this is known as our deck of fate system. Um, the, the reasoning behind why we have two of these systems is similar to how I was talking about different brain types for character creation. Mm -hmm. um, there are different players who enjoy role-playing games for different reasons. There are those who really enjoy let's say, the, the die rolling aspect, the people who, let's say, really enjoy combat, that type of stuff, uh, who like to play it kind of like a diet, uh, miniature game. And then there are also people who really enjoy the role-playing aspect of it. And systems tend to lean towards one or the other. Um, right? So, like, Fate, for example, is a really good example, or, like, Monster of the Week is a good example of a system that leans further towards role-playing. Um, and... To, to try and facilitate a gameplay experience that uh, was good for every type of player, we effectively needed two systems. The die roll system is as you would expect. Um, if you're familiar with games like Dungeons Dragons and so forth, you're basically rolling against a particular target number. If you happen to beat that target number, you successfully do the role-playing thingy that you're trying to do, which is wonderful. 
Uh, the downside to that particular system, though, is that gameplay mechanics, right, uh, whatever it is, should lend themselves to generating the experience that you want. And for anyone who really wants to roleplay, to be told that everything you said, this like brilliant script, the speech, whatever you did that was super convincing, meant absolutely nothing because you rolled a critical failure is the worst. Um, unless, obviously, if you have a phenomenal GM who finds a way to fudge that particular mechanic to make that better for you, such as giving you a cool bonus for roleplaying really well. That runs into a completely separate problem, though, which is that not everyone has a good GM. In fact, there are way, way more players than there are GMs already, so hoping that you somehow stumble on a phenomenal GM for your group is you know, it, it's very, very unlikely, and we want to make sure that more people can have more fun in more scenarios, no matter what they have around them. So, uh, because of that, that's why we introduced the Deck of Fates. And uh, the way that you can switch from one system to another comes from the fact that um, in Emberwind, every check that you roll uses a d20, but you're rolling low, not high. So if anyone's played like Call of Cthulhu, it's like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a bunch of reasons why we flip the die around. It's not just so that we're like super special, awesome, and unique. Uh, but one of the slick reasons why we did that is by doing so, every single time you're rolling anything, it's always going to be out of 20. And because it's out of 20, your odds are standardized. We can actually mutate your game system without causing any sort of balance issues to the game. And that's where the deck of fates comes in. If you happen to want to role play a lot, uh, and make that roleplay rewarding, we set up a deck of cards where you have a certain amount of cards um, equal to your base skill value. Uh, so if let's say you have a fast talk skill value of eight, you get eight success cards and then 12 failure cards to create your base deck of fates. Now in this particular scenario, you'll begin to roleplay. You'll roleplay uh, with me as let's say the GM and you'll say something that's gonna try and convince me more of what you want. Mm-hmm. Right, and every time you say something that uh, provides me with like a oh yeah, you know, logically I can see how I would agree with that, then I will add extra success cards to the deck. Every time you flub, uh, I will add extra failure cards to the deck until we hit a natural conclusion point on that particular story. And when we do that, we shuffle your brand new deck that's had all these extra cards added to it, and then we'll draw a card from it, which will determine whether you succeeded or not. But your success rate has now actually been impacted not only by uh, your base skill value, right? It's not just about math anymore. It's also been impacted by how you actually role play through the scene. And the beauty of the fact that we have these two systems that work in this uh, interlocking way is that both types of players can get their the exact type of gameplay experience they want out of the game without necessarily forcing any other player to have to compromise, right? Because one player can use the deck of fates while another player uses the dice system and even better than that at any point you feel comfortable enough to want to try the other you can and hopefully through that you'll not only learn new things that you might enjoy but also pick up new skills it might make you better at role playing it might make you better at you know uh, stats and math and all that type of stuff and the whole goal of Emberwind isn't just to make sure you have a really really fun time that's personalized to just you it's to make sure that you're growing not only in levels uh, or we call them tiers with your hero but also leveling up as a person too mm-hmm. and incident incidentally that brings me to the to one thing that i remember really liking in the system and that is cap or yeah. critical <laughs> accuracy penetration because i've certain i've certainly dealt with plenty with plenty of um of roll under systems including including one from a from a dear friend of the temple but in terms of this tiered approach that it that is pre- that is present here. That's something I don't see all that often. Usually, it's a case of you roll you roll under and you e- you either hit or you don't hit. Yeah. Um, so that was actually born out of my frustration with armor class. <laughs> oh, jo- <laughs> like, join the join the club on join the yeah. club on that. Yeah. So the big problem with um with armor class and for people who aren't familiar with armor class, uh, it's effectively how likely you are to dodge something right in in a game um but most games handle armor class by taking your armor value and adding in let's say your dexterity or some sort of evasion stat together but from from like a a role-playing perspective from a narrative perspective anyone can see that there's a complete difference between 
being able to, you know, artfully dodge out of the way of the swing versus absorbing the hit through a lot of, let's say, armor plating. So um, to to deal with that, we had to effectively split up um, the stats. So we have in Emberwind a dodge value, which is effectively your AC, your likelihood of evading a particular action. But we also have barrier values, such as toughness and resistance, which are effectively your soak. How much damage reduction do you have against um, particular types of damage? And um, just to round it out, we also have willpower, which is a condition-based dodge, for a lack of a better way of explaining it, which mm -hmm. allows you to avoid you know, status effects and so forth. And the really nice thing about breaking up all these numbers in this particular way is that it provides a lot more depth to builds, right? You're not just going, well, I need high dex to survive or I need, you know, full plate to, to make up for it. Uh, now you need to consider, like, am I necessarily good at absorbing magic damage? Am I really good at absorbing physical damage? Am I good at dodging things? Does this particular creature, you know, uh, not care what my dodge is? Do they have auto hit abilities? Is this person stacking on, like, several things of poison? How do we remove it? Do we just resist it? All of that, um, all of those, I guess, nuances to how your character both survives and succeeds in all these different scenarios full of you know threatening foes and whatever else that's that all comes back to one of the things that we're trying to do the most with Emberwind, which is empower you as a player to feel like you have a lot of agency like your choices are consequential that your mm -hmm. identity is well defined and so forth right we just want to do it with the least amount of stats possible so that it's not like an overly clunky system mm -hmm. uh but we also recognize that the least amount of stats to do it with is more than one. Yeah, and as te as tempting as it would be, as it would be to have everything consolidated into one stat, um, that is that is something that's never going to be satisfactory. I don't know if it's never going to happen, right? Like gaming constantly evolves. There are going to be people that are brighter and more intelligent than we are now who have come up with all these cool inventions and ways to make stuff work right like one of the best inventions of all time in my opinion in tabletop gaming is advantage right coming up with just rolling an extra die and taking the better roll right that is phenomenal as a mechanic and you never know someone could come up with a way to make a one number system work but uh, that that definitely wasn't me because i am not that smart I um in some of the games that I've run I've utilized a mechanic that I that I call die flipping. Oh, uh, that sounds cool. Do you mind uh, elaborating? The if you want the math nerd version, if so, if if something if something is a if something is a die flip, um you take you take whatever you take whatever you ro you take the number that you roll then subtract from 20. So you're literally flipping over to the opposite end, opposite end of the um, scale. Okay. Uh, I pr I put it in there as a as a kind of parachute mechanic after seeing something similar with one of the characters in the card game in the card game at, um, Yomi. Mm -hmm. Where they where they were able to to um do it to flip over certain certain cards at the expense of health. It's not. It's it's meant as a um escape. It's meant as a escape button. Um, and I've also I've also been trying to integrate in some in some of my own projects the um the flexible attack system that Thirteenth Age had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a phenomenal system. Because I found because I liked how with something like that, the actual number that you roll matters, as opposed to just whether or not you roll high or roll low. Yeah, but I can I can see it like the the only real, the only real problem I've ever that I've ever had with advantage the way certain games do it, especially more ubiquitous ones, is the swinginess of it. Uh, yeah, I mean it can be swingy, but I don't know if it's like more swingy than let's say getting like a plus thirty eight modifier or something, you know. Um, it's a it's certainly a it's certainly a possibility, but um, 
given given what you had given what you had mentioned um the other th the other thing that i've that i found interesting is in the um in the class list and mm -hmm. i'm i'm cuz you have you have nine classes that kind of operate on this 3 by 3 format <laughs> yeah that's one way to put it i definitely know what you mean i don't know if your listeners will oh uh, which I think I think we should I think that's something we should cl we should clarify what I mean by the by a th by three by three. Yeah. Um, so uh, just really quickly, then in Emberwind we have uh, three categories of classes, and there are three classes that belong to each of these categories. One of those categories, for instance, would be something like a harbinger, which is a general term for uh, character classes that like to play around uh, more with spells than not. Um, the reason why we don't use language like straight up, oh, you are you are a spellcaster is because uh, other classes, the, even the ones that aren't as focused as the harbingers are, can play with spells too. And if you happen to design your character in a way where you pick one of those classes that are spellcasting oriented and take zero spells, you're not useless. You're not bad at all. There's a ton of different ways to make that work for you. It's really just a, a way to kind of help you conceptualize the flavor of that particular character faster. Mm -hmm. And along with that, there are the other two categories are soldiers, which are more martial classes, and then you have the commanders, which are the, uh, for lack of a better term, kind of the leaderish, supportish things. But like they're they're definitely not just that either. No, the um, the. They very much remind me of the of the of the class that even the even the biggest haters of for, of Ori can't can't argue against me with, and that is the Warlord. I mean, yes, the Warlord is a phenomenal class. I am a diehard fan of that, um, and yeah, the the commanders definitely feel like the Warlord. Mm -hmm. And yeah, third edition had the um, had had the had the marshal, but one that was in the minute that was in the miniatures handbook for some reason. So I'd say not a lot of people even knew about it. And two, um, the marshal's the marshal's ability to be, to be battle to be frontline support amounted to numbers go up, and because it was in the miniatures handbook, it didn't get supported compared to other classes. Yeah, though I do think in third ed they were trying to make that archetype filled by let's say the paladin and the cleric. But really, I, I think that just resulted in, let's say, the cleric feeling really overpowered. Are you familiar with uh, Codzilla? Uh, no, actually. Would you like to share? Codzilla is an is an acro is an acronym known as cleric or druid. Just at just <laughs> adding in Godzilla in it, and it's meant to reflect on the fact that a cleric or a druid in third edition, or a cleric or a warlock in fifth edition, who knows what they're doing, is an entire party unto themselves. It could argue yep. that it could be argued as D and D on easy mode. Yep. Yep. Very true. Oh. Yeah. To the point where the where those two are um are considered tier one in the um gamesologist tier system. Oh. Huh. I don't I don't want to delve too deep into the tier system, but it was something that the brilliant gamesologist forums came up some years back when it came to Demonstrate when it came to demonstrating the amount of contribution that certain classes have o over others. Tier ones are able to do multiple things very, very well, and like I said, they are they can be entire parties all to themselves. Whereas some something like say a monk is a tier four where it's good at one thing, but other classes are better at it. Yeah. Yeah, even in their one thing, they're outshone by someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't. It didn't help that t that um, monks back then were the poster child for multiple ability dependency. Yep. <laughs> um, because, well, if you're playing fighter, all you need is just is pro is probably just strength and constitution to be high. You're playing a monk. You need you need strength. You need dexterity, and you need and you need wisdom at minimum. At the very least, yep. Um, Star packed warlocks in fourth edition were another example of this issue. But 
when it came, but when it came to the class, the class design, going into that simplicity thing, I'm guessing that's the reason why you have the three bullet points in front of each class's actions. Yeah. So um, again, you know, being someone from uh, like a mental health background, uh, neurology, cognition, all that type of stuff, um, there's a phenomenal thing or fact about the brain this could be overturned in the future when science changes and their mind on this again but effectively you have in your working memory a grand total of roughly three slots that's as many things as you can remember and anything else beyond that uh that's gonna that's gonna just get forgotten but there's a really cool trick that allows you to get more out of your working memory known as clumping um, so you can remember, for example, one, two, three, not as three separate things, but as a sequence, and that will only use up one slot in your working memory. So um, Emberwind is designed to strictly adhere to the rule of threes. There is only really a couple of exceptions to this, uh, one of those exceptions being the Atlanta, but that's the unique characteristic of it, where they get to play around with four different schools slash expertises. But um, everything else in the game has is designed around, let's say, three categories of classes, every category having three classes, and each class having three particular flavors of stuff that they do. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to... Given, given that, um, I'm guessing that rule of three is also the reason why when it comes to what you, what a class can give you, there's th there it's in um, three categories: traits, actions, and tide turners. Uh, yeah, at least that's partially correct. Um, if it were to give you more things than that, it would honestly, I think, be overwhelming uh, for for some players. But um, kind of that was, I think, all we needed. Like it was just elegant and just happened to fit that way, right? Like uh, for. People who are unfamiliar with Ember Wind, your class actions, you can think of them as your at will, you can use them unlimitedly. And they're the most defining part of uh, kind of your build in what you do. Then there are your class traits, which use up action slots. And uh, they fall into one of two categories. They're either passive, which give you numeric bonuses at the, at the exchange of flexibility because you've got one less at will you can perform, or they're a specific at will that has such a defining impact on how you play that it really flavors you into a particular direction. Uh, so in, in the same sense, it's giving you a power enhancement at the cost of flexibility. Um, and then finally, you've got your, your tide turners, and your tide turners are kind of your superpowers. They're the you know uh, button you hit when it's an oh shit moment to showcase just how cool and awesome you are as a hero. Mm -hmm. Now, the... I will admit that there's a f that um, I did ha I did have a bit of a laugh when I when I saw that there was a mix of classes that were going to be familiar to people who had who had worked with other, um, with other RPGs as well as as well as some that m that might be might be a bit of less so, um, it did give me a laugh to see to see the presence of a archer instead of a ranger, so that that's a bullet dodge <laughs> there. Yeah, I mean, one, uh, the ranger's never been done well in a game. They're always considered, like, the literal butt of all the jokes. But uh, more than that, the uh, the the fact that the ranger is flavored in a way where they're supported by an animal companion it wasn't something that we wanted to add in to the game, uh, which is one of the reasons why we divested our way from the concept of a ranger and moved towards the, the archer that is currently present in Emberwind. Ironically, though, despite being named an archer, I would argue not only as the developer, but just as like anyone who plays it will be able to determine this themselves, that our archer is much better at fluidly switching between ranged and melee combat than any ranger has ever been in any version of D&D &D or Pathfinder. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do... And I've picked, I've picked on the... I picked on the ranger more... Um, my fa in my fair share of times and i th i do maintain that the reason part of the part of the reason why the ranger has been has been such a curse even ba even back in the ad and d days it was a curse <laughs> um <laughs> is the is the fact that 
it is it is so demanding of a specific type of environment um mm -hmm. much in, much in the same way that the cavalier bit back in the early unearthed arcana days was very much dependent on being on being on the mount and it's a little hard to justify that when you're in a freaking dungeon yeah yeah i remember playing a game uh where two of the other people playing as you know heroes in my game one was a cavalier and one was a ranger and i was just like oh my god why uh, it didn't help that the uh, the third player was a monk who did not have high rolls in three stats so um yeah that that was uh that ended very quickly that campaign tpk uh not quite um it was a tpk minus the uh ironically the druid in the party which carried everyone to the end that's not a tpk no no it's it's definitely not a tpk but like uh if you wanted to find it as the rest of the party dying then there you go because i honestly that druid didn't need us from the beginning it's <laughs> It's def. It is. <clears throat> it is definitely a. It is definitely a case of. Um, I'd say. I'd say. I'd say in something like that. This is why session zeros are so important to avoid situations like this. Uh, or as well as to make clear that certain builds might not be the best approach for the adventure that's going to happen. You see, that only works well if you have the type of GM who really likes to pre-plan. If you have the type of GM that really likes to just fly by the seat of their pants and improv their entire way, not so much. Um, and unfortunately for us, uh, we end up playing in a group where the person who was GMing at the time was very much the latter. Mm -hmm. Which I can, I can, com I can completely understand. I can completely understand that. Um, as an as an aside, since you call the system the Rise Engine, but you wrote you wrote it all in caps, is it supposed to be an acronym that I just missed? Uh, no, um, it is not supposed to be an acronym. Uh, we wanted to make the title pop to make it easier for people to recognize that it is a title and not just a random word in the middle of copy. Uh, one of the reasons being that. Despite it being an RPG system, and a lot of RPG systems are very text-heavy, we actually went and approach that tried to make it so that this game was actually uh, dyslexia-friendly. So uh, any time that a proper name, something that really kind of breaks the, the lore and the narrative that's happening in the system, and we're just talking about the system, we put it in all caps so that it's a lot easier to recognize. Mm -hmm. And... When it came to fo when it came to um, faux creation, what gave what gave the idea to do the AI hexes? Oh man, okay. So uh, this is I have I have so many reasons I could throw out here. Um, obviously, you know, not everyone's going to have a GM, and having an AI system really helps with that. That, that was the main thing, really, just to make sure that the game was accessible to all types of players and audiences, right? But uh, there are more reasons to that. The The other reason is I have played with enough groups where, um, for and this is in no way to insult that particular GM, but their handling of the creatures that they deployed was ultimately subpar. Like, it wasn't fun. Um, this it comes down to a lot of different things like not knowing what to do having too many creatures on the field trying to figure out how to make the creatures interesting to play against for every person who is controlling a pc in a way that made their pc feel unique and shine uh to even stuff like just try to keep the group engaged after you know having to flip through 300 pages of rules to find the stats of every single creature type over and over and over to check for for all the different numbers that you got to roll die against to uh, leading to like the, just the mental exhaustion of the people sitting around the table waiting for their turn to come up. Right. So all of those things contribute to a really not fun experience. So um, the faux system in Everwind is supposed to alleviate all of those things, but in a very dynamic way where uh, the, the in quotes AI system um, that can control the creature for you in lieu of a GM um, it can be turned on or off down to every single turn. Uh, and when it is deployed, not only does it make uh, combat run super fast, it 
it also does so in an engaging way. That also allows for, and this is this is one of the coolest parts of the system, in my opinion, uh, for the system to evolve and challenge you not just as your player character, but as your player, because the creatures have a way to rewrite their own AI so that they can better adapt to encounter the player's metagame. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. There, there's a lot more things I can say about the AI system. It's probably one of the, the systems that people are most curious about, and I get the most questions about, because it's so different than other things out there. There are also a bunch of evolutions to the system that haven't been released yet, such as like the RAID AI system that's currently in development that will alter how uh, the the basic faux AI works to the point where you can effectively have like those good old like 40-man raid fights that you really enjoyed in like, you know, the heyday of World of Warcraft. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I guess um I don't know what, what would you like to know about it if you'd um, like to know any more. What I what in well first off ha, has any have you or anybody else tried to use that tried to use that system in a GMless format? Oh yeah, of course. I mean, if it didn't work in a GMless format, I can't advertise the game as being something you can play without a GM. Mm-hmm. And. I'm guessing I'm guessing that a big a big reason why questions get asked on that is because of the whole hexagon setup with that system. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So one thing that is noteworthy is that the AI grid is set up in a hex shape, which radiates outward from a center. Um, the reason why it's set up like that is actually uh, related to two things. One is probability. And the second and super fun thing is uh, the D6 is the most common die, and we want to make sure that people could play Emberwind with the least amount of additional resources required. That's why uh, we use the standard D20 die set. Uh, that's why all the formulas in the game typically cap out at 4D something, which is the exact amount of dice sets that you'd find in a playgroup of the standard playgroup size of, you know, four people, right? If everyone just pulled their dice together. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the, the AI system is also structured on that D6. We played around with the idea of trying a D10 too, because D10 is the second most common die, but uh, really the D6 did everything you need. And the reason why is because if you roll a number on a D6, right, because there are six numbers, you have a one in six chance, right? One in six is a significant odd of something, but it's still pretty low. If it's two in six, this translates to a very simple 33% chance, right? It's a one in three. That is a number that people recognize, understand, and is significant to people. At three out of six, now you have a 50-50 odd of something coming up, right? And that's also something that people understand. Same thing with 66% chance and so on and so forth. So uh, that number just works out extremely well. And because of the hexagonal shape, we can actually build out a visual grid in a way where uh, certain AI scripts can straddle the line between, let's say, a roll of a one and a two, allowing them to have uh, interesting weighting options because they're twice as likely to come up than, let's say, any hexes that are on a specific and singular uh, die roll. Um, this means that uh, you'll end up in situations where if a creature, let's say, learns from you and then rewrites their own AI with one of these hexes that straddle the line, it comes up more often, which means that players will more frequently see these cool interactions that reward... Um, Reward's a weird word because uh, technically you're being punished for it, but effectively responds. That's that's a better term mm -hmm. for it. That responds to the input you're putting in as a player. It certainly makes sense. Now, with hopefully, that, yeah, I'm trying to explain like a visual thing with words here, and uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe do some like editing and put like a visual in in the video later to help people understand what I'm talking about. No, I don't think that I don't think that'd work either because I'd have to do a I'd have to do a full on PowerPoint thing, and I am not that good of an editor to do it. I mean, we we have something like that if you want we can we can definitely give that to you and you can splice it in <laughs> appreciated but i'll t but i'll take a rain check on that offer sounds oh. good so I, yeah, I for, know for anyone who's confused by this uh just visit the the website emberwindgame.com check out the full rules available in the rule set compendium area and it'll all make sense hopefully yeah, and that brings me to something else yeah. the website integration Especially, yes. especially the hero and foe and foe creation, because mm -hmm. again, this is something that I, 
The only the only game in the last few years I can think of that's gone out of its way to have some sort of website integration like this kind of like this kind of thing is stuff like Lancer with the CompCon creation um, character creation and management system. Yeah, um, I guess uh, you want to know why we're doing it. I I want. I want to know how I want to know how that came to be. Was it a was it a case of something that just came up naturally? Uh no, it came up about as naturally as COVID did. Ha <laughs> ha But um uh while COVID definitely was an influence to it, um I I always had plans to do it. The like when I first dropped Emberwind uh right, you know, before COVID to kind of showcase what it was and over time build up the system to what it is now. And, you know, there, there's still plans to continue expanding the system for years to come. I had designed a full plan of things that I wanted to release, all the modules, all the content, everything that was supposed to be the full-on, this is, this is Emberwind, this is Rise, this is all of that, that had more than 10 years worth of content. At the very end of all the content that we released, I wanted to put out a, uh, effectively the stuff that you would need as a player to create your own content. Right? You're not just playing through our storylines anymore. You're creating your own adventures. And the reasoning why I want to do it in that particular order is because everyone who is already capable of making their own content has other systems to do that with. Right, And if we have limited resources and that you know I am one guy and I can only do so much, uh, I need to pick and choose where I want to start with. I want to pick to. I really want to pick and support the people who always wanted to get in tabletop games but didn't have a single tabletop game out there that appealed to them. Hence why we went with the uh, pre-written content first, the campaign books, and so forth. Um, but eventually, anyways, this whole integration, this whole uh, what we call Nexus, all these different content creation tools, all that stuff was supposed to be given to all the players so that you were able to support, build whatever you want, and enjoy Emberwind as a true alternative to all the role-playing games out there that people know and love. Now, um, as I already hinted at this, uh, COVID decided to throw a wrench in all those plans. And when COVID hit, uh, because no one knew when it was supposed to end, in fact, right now, while well, we've all treated it kind of like it's ended, but hasn't really, uh, we're in this weird situation where we were like, well, we've got to support the game somehow, but we don't know when we're going to be able to get any physical copies printed out. We don't know when we're going to be able to manufacture anything. We don't even know when conventions are coming back. So the best way to try and, and, and again, remember, the, the whole goal behind NOM, uh, right, my, my company, all that is specifically to promote, preserve, and improve um, everyone's mental health while they're all having a really fun time. Mm -hmm. We had to come up with a way to kind of shrink the social distance between everyone while the pandemic was raging and everyone was stuck in their own basements. So uh, what we wanted to do was we wanted to revise kind of our pipeline uh, rather than do all of the uh, content that we wanted to release first, we flipped the script and decided that we were going to build all the content creation tools first so that players could, utilizing the stuff that we had put out so far, create their own stories, find ways to integrate and play, and also bring more of the their friends into the fold and playing with them no matter where they were, no matter if they were stuck social distancing and whatever else. So um, that's one of the reasons why uh, I did it, and specifically in the particular order that I did. The other reason why I really wanted to push um, Nexus, uh, regardless of the order, is simply because of accessibility. For whatever reason, uh, and spoiler alert, that reason is money, um, tabletop games, specifically tabletop RPGs, have been stuck in the past forever. Uh, almost every single tabletop game has at most... Uh, you know, uh, integrated themselves into modern technology and so forth by simply promising people a PDF of the book. And there are lots of companies out there that don't even include the PDF with the physical purchase. You know, not not uh, looking at anyone specifically, but like, hey, wizards, come on, please, right? Like, everyone pays so much money for your stuff. Why do they have to buy it again on, let's say, D&D Beyond? Especially now that you own both, right? <laughs> so... At the, um, very, but at the very least, Hero at the very least, Hero Lab comes with a comes with a support suite for several different games. But right, 
but like it's still not the level of integration that people want to see anymore, right? Like video yeah. games have taken this concept and run with it, come up with a million ways for you to do it. We're even to the point where we can like stream AAA games on your phone almost. Well, yet yeah. it's fun. It's funny you bring that up because, um, I I'm I'm friends with one of the developers of World of Warcraft, and I had I've talked with him about this issue, and something that he said that he wa that he's wanted to see is a tabletop equivalent to the Steam Workshop for for certain oh. games. Hold um, on. Hold on. Don't don't spoil things. Not yet. <laughs> um <laughs> So, sorry to to kind of scone with the conversation there again, yeah. but um but yeah, effectively I wanted to create the Nexus as a fantastic and phenomenal way for people to create their own content, right? Uh because that's that's what people demand now. And if they don't demand it, they should demand it because that's what accessibility is, right? Uh, I don't know why the best way of distributing tabletop RPGs we have is drive through, and drive through is still a site from the '90s. So, um, with all that all said, the goal, the ten-year plan for Emberwind originally was to do all our pre-generated content uh, that would hopefully over time build up our fan base and also our revenue to the point where we could release Nexus, which is a fully integrated database of content that not only we create, but the public creates for Emberwind. That particular infrastructure though, um, at the end of the 10 year mark, I was hoping to actually open up and extend to other games mm -hmm. to help the other indie developers get noticed to effectively create not only a Steam Workshop, but a Steam for tabletop games. Mm -hmm. That's still in the, the plans, that's still in the cards, that's still something I really, really very much want to do. Um, but uh, when I do it and if I do it will come down to how much the company grows, how much continued support we uh, get from the community as we continue to develop our games, to which, by the way, I am very grateful for for everything from people just picking up a copy of our stuff, even listening to me pitch my game, to uh, to even you know you right now, Mildred, uh, having me as a guest onto your show. Mm -hmm. um, all that's been absolutely phenomenal and I can't do uh, I can't do any of this without any of you. Um, and if I'm going to ever uh, achieve those particular goals where I, I'm trying to make this larger, greater community, this ecosystem for every tabletop gamer out there, um, you know, I, it, I'll definitely need uh, more and more of your assistance along the way. Mm -hmm. And with that, with that in mind, I do want to, th I will, I, what? I do want to give my th I do want to give my thanks for you, for you um being op being open to come all the way down to the temple and enjoy the insanity that at play around here. I mean, you promised me drinks. I can't <laughs> say no to that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to further go whether it's to further go into um Ember some of the particulars with Emberwind um game design as a whole, or just or just to just to let just to laugh at the Leafs again. Uh, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, I'll definitely take that level of encouragement along with everyone else's encouragement to mm -hmm. continue uh, keeping on and keeping on with all of the uh, development with Nom that I've been doing. Um, you know, thank you for having me for guest here. Love to be back at any point uh, mm -hmm. to chat game design or really any other topic. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, because uh, honestly, it's a really cool art form, uh, in my opinion, that I'd love to see not only more people experience, but more people try their hand at. And with uh, the, the indie dev scene kind of going the way that it is, um, who knows, right? Like, uh, maybe maybe someone who listens to this particular podcast, maybe even you, Mildra, you're going to be like the the next Wizards of the Coast and release <laughs> something super awesome, super cool that everyone happens to love. Um, I don't think that's going to happen because Wizards of the Coast doesn't like me. <laughs> I mean, they don't have to like you. You just need to come up with something that makes everyone like you more than them. Uh, <laughs> but at the, at the very le at the very least, I'm the, I'm less particular as far as as far as the people that I bring in because again, open again, open bar. So as long as they follow the rules, I don't um I don't tr I don't treat this as a secret club or anything like that. I'm not I'm not the fucking Illuminati, <laughs> but. 
and of, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>